Welcome everyone. We are today talking about search engine marketing and myths. So what you're a part of right now is our actual first digital meetup for the entrepreneurs workshop. This is the first time that we're actually trying to do something in a digital space to bring the meetup group to you guys and make it a lot easier to attend, a lot easier to interact, and mostly to get the information that we're trying to, trying to provide and put out here for everyone. So you can check out us at tw.network, and we've got some of the events listed up on there, and we also have a great mailing list we send out every month with some of these events that we have going on. So uh, we do run events every month, just about every month we have something happening, and those are usually in the loop in Chicago. We've had some really great stuff going on in the past in terms of presentations. We do potlucks, which are about seven different professionals each speaking for five minutes. Our study hall for adults is the chance as an entrepreneur to just sit down and work on your own stuff for a little while. Just take a break from everything else, take an hour, sit with us. We've also done some panels for live website reviews, and we've also done these great little consultant speed dating events that we're gonna be continuing throughout the year. In addition to that, we have a really exciting event coming up at the end of July. We think entrepreneurs need a break, and it's not fair that you don't get a break. <laughs> Paige, I don't even know if we've talked about this yet. <laughs> We have not, but I'm listening. So we have created Entrepreneur Ditch Day. And what we're putting together right now are about six hours of Chicago-based activities that's going to be run through the Entrepreneur's Workshop to help you see some of the city, take in some of that little tourist feel of doing things while also networking and connecting with other professionals. So it's your chance. Thursday, July 26th, you take the day off. You come hang out in the city. You meet some new people. You, you've earned it. You've earned it. Even just by being here today, you've earned it. So we'll send you more information on that. The Entrepreneurs Workshop has a great team behind it. So we're put together with a handful of people, Alex, Siobhan, Benjamin, Alexander, myself. We all take a really active role and take this serious and in looking to build community between entrepreneurs. It's something that we're really passionate about. And we think the more that we can all work together, the more that we can accomplish and make Chicago just an even greater city than it already is. So today, our first virtual meetup, how fantastic. So we have myself and Paige offering insight on a single topic. Today is going to be that idea of SEO and marketing. And by the time we're done, the one thing that we really want is just for you to save, just a little, even if this saves you 30 seconds of not having to look something up in the future, of to walk away with just one SEO or marketing myth that maybe we've now helped steer you in the right direction so you're not churning that energy and wasting time doing something you don't need to be doing. So five myths we're going to step through. Number one, that if you throw enough money at Google AdWords, you'll be on the first page of Google, everyone will love you, and everyone will buy from you. Number two, that you need to write a lot of blogs. Number three, that you need to put as many keywords possible on your site. Number four, that posting to social media increases your SEO. And finally, we're gonna look at this idea about once you optimize your site, is that it? Can you just, I can just walk away, right Paige? I can. I can also have my site and just be done? Totally. All right. We're done. Why are we even here? <laughs> uh, during this presentation, we know that you're able to post questions inside of Zoom. We would prefer you use slido.com for this, and you can use the code TEW for the Entrepreneur's Workshop. And what that's going to allow you to do is actually post the questions as well as vote up other questions that you see. At the end of, the, at the end of this webinar, we have a little bit of time set aside for Q&A, so we'll step into those, get some of those big questions answered. Wherever we don't get answered, we're gonna make sure that we try and get in a blog and get those answers back over to you guys, how everything's through. So, you'll get all of this if you're signed up on the TEW mailing list at tew.network. Feel free to head over there if you're not already on the mailing list where we're gonna push all this information back out to you. Today, you have myself. I am the founder of Martin Creative, a digital agency in Chicago, and our biggest advantage is helping companies understand where to spend their marketing dollars that you may not need to spend $10,000 on a brand new website. You might just need a $30 Squarespace site and a really great marketing mailing list. So that's what we look to help entrepreneurs do and focus their business efforts. Paige, why don't you tell us a little about you, a little about Spark here. Sure, so my name is Paige Worthy. I am Client Services Director for Spark. We are a content marketing and content strategy agency, also based in Chicago. We're down in the loop in the WeWork State Street offices. And we help uh, mainly B2B businesses 
put together really solid content marketing strategies and then execute on those. So we help with the writing, we help with the distribution, we do email marketing, we work on websites. We're also a HubSpot partner agency. HubSpot is an all-in-one inbound marketing software that also has a sales side now. So it really is a perfect solution for companies that are you know, at a certain size where they need to start ramping things up, start using automation to reach out to their prospects and their customers. And we can help kind of that, we're that all-in-one uh, helper to, to get your strategy fulfilled. Right. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, that was good. That was solid. So now let's go ahead and let's step right into this idea of those search engine marketing and myths. Paige, let's, Let's kick it off with this first one here and this first myth of if right. I have enough money at AdWords, I'll be on the first page of Google and everybody will buy from it. This is, is this false? <laughs> I, I, think there's, I think there's a common misconception in marketing period that if you throw enough money at anything, you'll be on the first page of everything and that everyone will buy from you. And uh, that's, you know, I think, your agency does a great job at helping people decide where is the smartest place to invest money. And that's the case with AdWords as well. I think um, you, can, you can get great results with AdWords, but it's not just a question of blowing out your budget. Like you have to really think about who you're trying to reach and what their needs are. What questions are they typing in when they go to Google? Um, you know, you when you start to tackle your marketing, whether you're writing blogs, ebooks, sending emails, buying AdWords, you want to really think through who is my ideal buyer persona? Who are the people that I can be a hero to in my business? And what do they need from me to help make their buying decision easier? Those are the people that you go after with your limited AdWords budget. Yep, it's that idea of kind of that user persona, which those are my magic keywords. When you, when you say user persona and you really start to understand who you're targeting, for me, it's that idea of, I think too many yep. people still look at a user persona of my target market is 35 to 45 years old and they make between 100 and 175,000. And one of the big things that we push for that you kind of mentioned as well is that customer journey of look, where are we catching them? What are they, what are they searching online? And when you start to narrow that marketing down to just one person, just one, just get it down to one single person, understand this is what they need, this is what they're looking for, this is what I can help provide, I feel like that's the spot yep. that it really opens up. And so um, when we look at the AdWords portion, how would someone know which words to then go through and invest money in at, on AdWords? Well, I mean, so I think to go back to the idea of buyer personas, user personas, whatever you want to, whatever you want to call it, those personas need to be built around actual information from real people. Um, you want to actually talk to the people who exist within your ideal buyer persona and actually listen to the words that they use when they're talking about the struggles that they have when they're trying to make a buying decision. And those are the words that you're going to use because those words are going to go straight from their mouth to their keyboard when they're typing something into Google if they're looking for it. So chances are, if, you, if your business exists in a crowded marketplace, you're probably going to be happier trying to target for longer tail keyword phrases on Google rather than, uh, you know, so we, okay, our, we have a client that is a patent law firm. There are a lot of massive patent law firms out there. And if we were buying Google AdWords for them, we would never say, hey, we're going to try and compete on patent law firm. And obviously, if we throw enough money at that, like we're going to be at the top. Well, no, because there are thousands of big law firms that are going to be able to bid more money and get out ahead of you. So you also have to think about what is our specialty as a business and how can we drill down into that patent law firm keyword and come up with a longer phrase that someone who's really specific in what they're looking for is going to be typing into Google. And that's what you bid on. You bid on the longer tail phrase that's going to cost less and attract a more qualified buyer. Make sense? That was, that was gorgeous. That was, yes, that is exactly what I wanted to hear. Everything that I wanted to communicate at this myth 
of if you throw enough money at it, it's, it's the words themselves. <laughs> It's understanding which words you're really trying to target, which words are you more likely to show up for than other words. Uh, we work with a lot of food tours. And so the idea of a food tour trying to just bid on the word food tour is so grand and generalized that even city name is one step further, but keep going. Like you said, those, for those who don't know, longer tail keywords, just yeah. more and more words, more words you can keep stacking yeah, on. Yeah, so to give, to give an example related to food tours, you know, there's, there's a company here in Chicago that I know you and I have talked about, Joe, Chicago Food Planet Food Tours. They do a walking tour of Chicago's Chinatown. And if you start bidding on phrases that are as long as that, and you, you get people who are actually looking for that kind of thing, that's money. Like, those are the people that are going to click on your ad, and they're going to fill out your form, and you're going to have them. Like, if your product is right, and you're using that phrase, it's a, it's a slam dunk. Love it. All right. We're on to this next little myth here. Myth number two, I need to write a lot of blogs. Hey, is this, is this still true? Let's, let's talk about blogging here. Uh, so I, I know when, when we were planning out the conversation that we were going to have during this webinar, um, this is a big topic, right? It's, and I think with, with a lot of things with content marketing, it's quantity versus quality right so you can carpet bomb the internet with a billion low quality blogs about really general stuff or you can dedicate the time the budget the effort to creating really deep sometimes lengthy but not necessarily consistent blog posts about topics that you know inside and out and that's so it, it's a, a question of working smarter, not working harder, um, which like, boom, I already saved you money. Don't bother writing a bunch of general blog posts that are never going to be able to compete with the big guys. Focus on writing what you know intimately and publish that and just keep going deeper on those few topics that you really want to go hard on. And that's, that's going to be your, uh, your secret sauce. So that's where I feel like it comes back down to that idea of that user persona, knowing what that person's really looking for. And when we look at yes. the idea of website conversions, um, what we see in kind of the e-commerce space, a general website conversion is going to be about 2%, meaning only 2% mm -hmm. of people who come to your site are actually going to buy from you. But companies spend so much time writing for the other 98% as if we focus <laughs> on that too. Oh, we're going to have much better success. And one of the things that I wanted to kind of stress here is um, I feel like a while ago, Google had this concept of more content is better. The more content you have, the better it is. And with those recent updates, I know that now they're looking at engagement on blogs. How long is someone staying on it? Are they actually reading it? Yes. So, okay. If you, can you elaborate on that a little yeah, bit? I think, I think uh, and I see what you mean now. So I think, yeah, getting people to stay on the page to scroll down to keep reading to get to your call to action and you know not just being you know oh I found the answer to my question at the top of the page I'm all done I can go away now so you want to keep engaging them uh, one way to do that is by when you do have kind of a critical mass of content on your website start doing some really good internal linking to other content on your website so if they if they're in the middle of a blog post about a Chinatown walking tour of, of Chicago. Um, and maybe you happen to write a post about, you know, great corporate retreats in, in Chicago that happen to involve a walking food tour. You know, make sure that you link to that content that someone from your user personas would maybe come to your website to read. Keep engaging them with content that's related to that. And, you know, you'll, you'll find that people are going to go deeper into your website maybe pepper in some links to your services page or your pricing page. The people who come to your site who end up deciding like, yeah, this is the company for me. You want to give them as many opportunities as you can to continue on down that funnel in their customer journey and make the, uh, make the commitment to uh, give you their information to raise their hand and say, I'm interested. I love the, I love the concept there of even doing the internal linking and starting to get things back to other pages on your site. 
I feel like we're moving away from a time of traditional websites when you need to have every page with every service, every product listed. And that we're almost looking at this time of sites being more of a one pager with really blogs filled with content about the services you provide and helping us share that knowledge. Absolutely. Pulling it in. All right. Let's move on. And to I've also, oh. I want to make, I want to make one more, one more quick point about, about that. Um, I think back in the day, people used to think about blog subscribers who would wait at their inbox. You know, every Tuesday at 7 a.m., I get my blog subscription email. That doesn't happen anymore. So again, your, your focus on your blog post should be focused on your organic visitor. So the, the person who is looking exactly for the topic that you have written about, and then uh, you don't have to worry so much about like, well, I'm covering, I'm covering too much ground on this one particular topic. That's just going to make you stronger in Google's eyes. Don't worry about your subscribers who are going to week after week be like, okay, okay, Chinatown, I get it. It's not like that anymore. You're, you're probably going to have a lot fewer subscribers. And there's a lot of different ways to engage with your subscribers that isn't necessarily blog posts. So that's another conversation for another time. But um, go deep. Don't, uh, don't just go for quantity. Which I feel like yeah. almost goes back to that idea of the longer tail keywords. Go, go deep on those. It does. It absolutely out. does. OK. Let's go ahead and step into myth number three now. Myth number three. Oh, this is a whirlwind. I need to put as many keywords possible on my site. This is something that uh, we've seen clients do in the past where let's stick with that idea of downtown Chinatown walking tour. Is it then on every single page title, they would put walking tour about walking tour, <laughs> walking tour, every single thing they try and just hit for that keyword in every spot. Is that the right way page? Of keyword stuffing. So this, this really harkens back, I think to, to a time of uh, black hat versus white hat SEO. You remember when we used to visit sites and if you, um, okay, maybe, maybe not everyone specifically clicks around the website like I do when they go to it. I, I read by highlighting text, but you used to be able to scroll down to the bottom of the website and there would be a, uh, a dark background and just a ton of words at the bottom, also in black text. So the human eye couldn't see it. Oh, but Google could. Google could see it and back then, Google valued being able to see all of those keywords until they got wise. And Google literally always gets wise to what people are doing. So don't, yeah, don't. Don't include as many keywords as possible. Um, I feel like we are, we are rolling these same points into every myth. So you want to create content that is tailored not to Google, but to the people who exist within your ideal buyer persona. So Google, Google is basically an advocate for your prospect. Google knows what actual humans are looking for at this point. Like the machine has become sentient and, and it's unbelievable. <laughs> it is so cool. Google has gotten very smart. Uh, there is a, a concept called semantic search, which basically implies that Google Google understands what you're going for when you're writing about something so that you don't have to focus on a specific and often very awkward phrase. Like back in the day when we would specify keywords that we were going to try to rank for, they would have to be in exact order or Google wasn't having any of it. Now, if, uh, you know, somebody wanted to type in like, where's the best, you know, like, where can I have a great tour of Chinatown? in Chicago. Google's going to know to serve that user with content that matches that question, even if the website doesn't have that exact phrase on it. So again, focus on catering to the questions and the needs of your buyer persona and work towards those long tail keywords. Focus on ranking for what you are specifically good at and what you know you can provide better than anybody else in the world. You may not give the best walking tour in the world, but you sure as heck give the best culinary walking tour of Chicago's Chinatown, and you can take that to the bank. What do you think? Paige, I'm, I'm so happy to be just having these conversations with you. We got a smaller portion of this conversation, but now to really kind of dig in here, like these, yep. these are the principles. These are the things behind it that make for a better marketing program. Stop writing for Google. Don't write for Google, don't write for search engines, write for your users 
Google will find you. They, you can't cheat Google. That's, yep. I don't know why people think they can, but nope. there's 10,000 developers working to make sure you can't cheat them. And they hire really smart people. Yeah. They are really smart people. Um, <laughs> hey guys, I noticed that, I noticed nobody has asked any questions yet. Definitely get those questions coming in. If you, if you hear something that makes you scratch your head, I want, I want questions to answer. I'm ready. <laughs> it's because you're so thorough, Paige. It's because we're so thorough. All right, let's go ahead and let's look at now myth number four. Myth number four, this concept that posting on social media increases my SEO. Can you, can you tell us about the connection between social media and SEO? How do those two play together? Um, not, not a lot. Um, I mean, I would say having, having a strong presence on social media and, you know, that, that can certainly benefit you in a lot of ways, but I would, I would say that SEO is probably pretty low on the list of benefits that it can have for you. Um, I don't know if you have any specific thoughts on, on this that I can piggyback off of. I can certainly talk about the values of social media. But in terms of SEO, I don't see it having a really great effect. That's kind of what I wanted to touch on with this one is, I feel like a lot of people or a lot of companies start looking at SEO as a way to bring in new customers when really the point of social media, sorry, use, use social media to bring in new customers. And the idea of using social media is really to connect more with your current customers than it is to bring in new customers. And that sure. so much of this is looking at, at the ROI, how much time are you really spending posting on all these different social networks and how many new leads? Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, the, the ROI of social media publishing, particularly if you are trying to rely on organic views on social media, that ROI is just continually plummeting. Um, you know, I, Facebook is, is the best example that I can think of. Um, you know, these days, unless you already have a pretty incredible customer base and have a lot of, um, you know, potentially viral content that you're sharing there, Facebook's not going to give you a lot of play if you're not paying. Uh, they really, they really want your money. And what you are paying them for is access to their users' data. I mean, we, we've all seen the, uh, the horror stories of, you know, Facebook sharing data with apps and this whole Cambridge Analytica thing blah, blah, blah. Facebook has incredible just stores of user data to leverage. And if you're willing to invest some money in social media advertising, Facebook ads, if that's where your user personas are hanging out, you need to make sure that the people you're trying to reach are actually on these social networks. <laughs> you're going to be able to use the data that Facebook has on people, and it's enormous uh, based on behavior, demographics, other stuff we clicked on, like Facebook knows everything about you. And that's great for a marketer if you're willing to put social advertising in the budget for your business. Um, so like for, for Spark, for our agency, we have a new email course. It's free. It's called the Six Week Content Detox. And we just started doing a little bit of advertising for it on Facebook, and we really drilled it down into people who are B2B, people who work in marketing, and people who exist at a somewhat higher level than you know, your typical you know, grunt level person. So we're really trying to get at those B2B decision makers in hopes of them interacting with our content, getting our emails for six weeks, and you know, hopefully deciding, hey, these guys are pretty cool. Maybe, uh, maybe we should do business with them. So you know, I think, just like posting blogs to your site willy-nilly, the spray and pray approach of just putting a ton of stuff on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, like that's not gonna help you reach people. It's not gonna help increase your SEO. It's really just gonna help waste your time. Um, if that's fun for you, if you're into time wasting, sometimes I am, um, <laughs> you should definitely do it. But, um, but I would say, again, work smarter. Think about who you're trying to reach where they're hanging out online and what messages will resonate with them. Like what kind of, what kind of marketing are they going to be receptive to on your social media? Um, with okay. customers, yeah, it's a great way to have new touches with your customers, people who already know you, you know, to interact with new content that you're putting out, 
for you to gather information from them. You know, you can do polls, you can, you know, post fun glimpses of what it's like to work inside your company. There's a lot of ways to help people further engage with your brand. But in terms of getting new, new eyes, um, you're probably going to have to pay for that. Um, I did see, well, I saw a question about LinkedIn posting for SEO that we'll, we'll answer at the, at the end. Um, but that's a great question. Okay. Yeah. So let's move on. We got to try and keep this under that 30 minute mark like we kind of told people they'd have. So myth number five, I think this one's actually a real quick one. I think this one, this one's a real quick one, Paige. Myth number five, yeah. I can optimize my site once and be done with it, right? I can, I can set it, forget nope. it. Nope. That is false. Um, there are, there are lots of reasons to take some periodic checks of how your SEO is doing over time. Um, A, Google gets wise to marketers tricks. So if you, if you read about an algorithmic change that Google has made and you know that you were doing something kind of gimmicky on your website before, um, it pays to you know, go into the back end of your website, look at what you've been doing SEO wise and make some adjustments so that your site doesn't get penalized. If everything is on the up and up and you're a relatively small website with not too many pages, you can probably do some intense work on the upfront and then come back every six months or so, reevaluate, have my buyer personas changed? Has my message changed? Have I added new services that I need to spend some time, you know, adding to the site so that people you know, when they search, they see this is a thing that I offer. Um, it helps to always have it in the back of your mind. You probably don't need to spend a couple hundred dollars a month on, you know, a crazy SEO platform that monitors everything for you and has like little monkeys at computers behind the scenes 24 seven. But it helps to keep it in the back of your mind and, um, and always be thinking, is my website working for me in all the ways it should? Um, Nothing on the internet is send and forget it. Yeah, we try and do it in the idea that that, that website, the, the marketing you put out there, is a digital salesperson. And how you decide to dress that person, what they decide to say, how often you need to update what they need to say, it's all, it's all the same thing it would be as if it were an employee that you had that then you're trying to train to make do the right things for you. So. Yeah. I also, I, I, love the, I love the phrase that your website is like the front door to your business. And if, if someone walked into your business, like if you were in a clothing store and you had a bunch of clothes on the racks in the front that were, you know, like from the set of that 70s show and somebody were looking for something current that fit their personality, I personally would turn on my heels and walk out of there. Like I'm not shopping for a Halloween costume. I'm looking for something that fits who I am right now. So if you think about your website as the front door to your business, what kind of, you know, there's, there's the user experience and there's also, you know, what Google sees at your front door. So always keep it in your mind. Love that idea. Love that concept as well. It's almost like walking into the front of a grocery store. Things are always changing when you walk in the front of a grocery store. Absolutely. Oh, I'm a sucker for an end cap. <laughs> All right. So we'll do, uh, we got a couple questions real quick. I still want to try and keep this in that 30 minute time frame. I know we're closing in at the end here. Uh, so we have two questions. Let's keep these. Oh, these are awesome Wait. questions. Yep, let's go with the first one. What about publishing on LinkedIn for SEO? So LinkedIn is, uh, is one of those interesting cases. Um, there are a couple of different ways that you might publish to LinkedIn. So there's your everyday uh, status, whether from your, uh, from your personal LinkedIn account or from your company page, that's probably gonna have about as much value as uh, you know, posting to Facebook. But LinkedIn came out with Pulse a couple of years ago, and I'm actually not sure if it's still called Pulse, but LinkedIn Pulse is basically LinkedIn's version of a medium or something like to that effect for uh, business thought leaders to share longer form thought. So we've had some success with clients uh, who wanted to repost some of their best performing content from their website to their LinkedIn Pulse to sort of reach a wider built-in audience who would maybe already be receptive to their message there so again it does take it does take some strategy you don't just want to carve up on linkedin with all of your blog posts um but especially if you if you exist within a really great niche that's super active on linkedin 
posting the posts and maybe sharing strategically within some groups that you're active in on LinkedIn can help you get some good solid eyes on your content. Sounds wonderful. Uh, we have one more question here. I'm going to take this one. Uh, it's from Denise. Awesome. If you if you if your clients don't know exactly who is their ideal customer or exactly what job customers hire them to get done, love the jobs to be done reference here, Denise. How do you learn that? And for that one, we're actually going to send across a link after all this is over. We'll put it together. Um, I put together a user persona kind of breakout to help you get some of those initial ideas. And I think the biggest part of getting that first user persona out is is guessing. You need to guess about your customers, then you need to test and validate the guesses that you've created and start to understand, run surveys, talk to customers. Paige. Um, so Denise, I love your question. Um, and that, that big strategic question is one that I think a lot of businesses don't necessarily spend the time to answer. Um, at Spark, we have a month long process that we call the foundation formula that we start, unless a client comes in and they already have a fully fleshed out content strategy, we start every client relationship with our foundation formula where we actually go through and we build those buyer personas. We spend a couple of hours on the phone with our new clients, their marketing, their sales team, and their top grass if we can get on the phone. And we, we learn about the products and services they offer where they exist in the market, where they fit into the general landscape of the industry. And then we actually contact their clients and we ask them a series of questions and we try to get inside the heads of those people and figure out if there are buckets that we can place those people in to form their buyer personas. So we, we eventually will fill in some kind of semi-fictionalized information that aggregates all those people and all the results of our interviews. But it's, it's a critical thinking exercise that I think every business should go through to really get an understanding, ask the hard questions, um, maybe even talk to customers that you lost or who didn't ultimately hire you to understand what you didn't have to offer them that made them go with someone else. That's all really important information to understand so that you can grow as a business, both on the content marketing side of things and just in, in business within the four walls of your actual office but this this, this i'm is passionate why, about that <laughs> this, is, this is why we work together on things all right we're gonna go ahead and wrap up. so we are we're at the end we are we're out of time here we're gonna keep going on thank uh -huh. you Paige, for taking time speaking with everyone sharing all this great information that's in your head our next event the entrepreneurs workshop is going to be tuesday june 12th it's going to be at the national building in the chicago loop we have six professionals talking about work-life balance a great event. We have, a, we have a 2008 Olympic gold medalist speaking on the idea of work-life balance. I'm excited to, to see where this goes with all this. So we will send over slides and contact info through the mailing list. If you would like to continue this conversation, uh, I've made five spots available to talk to you about this idea of building new personas. If you want to talk anywhere about the SEO or marketing side, you can go to martinchicago.com slash webinar. And that's going to take you over to link to grab one of the spots we have available and we can jump on that call and talk about even helping you start to develop some of these concepts from the ground up with your company. That is all we have. Thank you, Paige. Thank you, everyone. And we'll see you at the next event. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye, all.